Good evening, everyone. I'm just going to wait for Mike's mother to have a seat. We heard she was stuck in traffic, so we were planning to speak very slowly, but now we don't have to. <laughs> Great. Uh, well, welcome, everyone, um, to the, tonight's inaugural lecture series. Uh, it's the second uh, event of the series. Um, and I'm Laura Hammond. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Knowledge Exchange now. But until about a year and a half ago, I was a professor in the Department of Development Studies, so it gives me really great pleasure to um, host this event this evening uh, and to have a celebration of the work of Michael Jennings, as well as the work more broadly of the department. Um, one of the uh, reasons that uh, this event is, is special from my own, uh, to, close to my own heart is part because of my own history within the department. Uh, Mike and I joined the department in 2007, I think, together. Zoe joined probably, I think, the year before or maybe two years before that. Um, and we've been close colleagues ever since. Tonight's lineup of speakers is also something of a development studies relay team uh, because in 20. 16, I think, when I was finishing my term as head of department, I somehow convinced Mike to become the next head of department. And then he somehow convinced Zoe to be his successor as well. So there's a tr sort of trifecta of a succession of heads of department, uh, which is a role that I must say is, is in equal parts um, gratifying and sometimes stressful. Uh, but mostly gratifying, and, uh, and, and it's really an exciting thing to be part of this department, which leads uh, the way in so much cutting-edge research and teaching. Uh, for the last several years, we've been in the top three of the QS world rankings, so we're, this year we're number three in the world uh, for development studies departments, and it's great to have that, uh, the hard work that we do every year um, sort of recognized in that way, particularly because that's often a reflection of our peers and, and uh, our standing amongst in their eyes as well. Um, one of the things that the department is known for, a uh, couple of things, is for its interdisciplinary mix of creative researchers and students working, as I said, at the cutting edge of, of a whole range of different uh, developmental kind of issues and areas. And I think we pride ourselves on bringing our research into the classroom, and Mike has really excelled in all of those ways, um, both through his, uh, his research and as well his really um, well-recognized uh, strength as a teacher. And so tonight's a great uh, opportunity to see those things come together and have him be our teacher for the evening. Um, before uh, we hear from Mike, I'm going to introduce Zoe Marriage, who uh, is going to provide the testimonial for Mike. So she will introduce Mike, and I will introduce Zoe. Um, Zoe, as many of you will know very well, but maybe not everyone does, is a professor of security and, and, and international development in the development studies department. She's had um, a varied career, I would say, looking at different kinds of uh, development questions, but always looking at some aspect of the relationships between conflict, security, and development. So her early work looked into the questions of who receives humanitarian assistance in context of conflict and why, and it was based on research in Sierra Leone, Rwanda, South Sudan, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. And it was uh, kind of culminated in her book, Not Breaking the Rules, Not Playing the Game. She then went on to do more intense work within the Democratic Republic of Congo, investigating the different ways in which Congolese people conceptualize and pursue security in situations of unremitting structural and direct violence. And that work was the focus of uh, her book, Formal Peace and Informal War. And then more recently, she's found a way of mixing her academic and personal interests um, uh, in capoeira through work that considers how those who are most insecure are routinely barred from formal security debates and policies and how they often express their resistance in the musical and physical art form of capoeira. Again, this work is featured in her most recent book, Cultural Resistance and Security from Below. Uh, she also then, as I mentioned, just finished a uh, term last year as head of department. She's also been the convener of our MSc program in violence, conflict, and development, and has now come, is finishing her year of well-earned sabbatical, so we'll have her back with us in the department coming from September. So Zoe, would you like to come up and uh, tell us about Mike? Thank you. 
Thank you, Dora. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, family, and friends. I want to start a few years ago when Mike's children were still young. Uh, Mike was wondering out loud about how a Scrabble piece had got itself lodged behind one of his piano keys. That led us to a conversation in which Mike said, Zoe, don't tell anyone. <laughs> uh, but I'm an accordionist. Uh, we can know a lot about people from the instruments they play. Accordion players have this rare ability to hold the bass and play the melody. It's a portable instrument. They can adapt to any style uh, and any situation. And accordion players have an immensely supportive role through the volume, the nature, and the quality of the work that they do. Mike is an extraordinary scholar. He has his base in history uh, from the University of Oxford and SOAS. If you look carefully, you can see Mike's historical reach extends back to Tanganyika in the 1860s. As a historian, he needs evidence. It's already happened. You can't make it up. And a history perspective is somewhat unusual in, in development studies. It defines how he approaches his research and how he interprets development. Mike wrote his PhD, Surrogates of the State, Oxfam and Development in Tanzania in the 1960s and 70s, using NGO archives as a source, just as they were being made available. In fact, he was one of the first academics to use this methodology. That research also ended up looking at the role of churches in development in Tanzania, which led to a second research strand on religion, faith-based organizations, and development. Mike's historical interest brought him into a team uh, led by DFID to do a scoping study, which led to a research center, and ultimately to the publication with Gerald Clark of one of the first books uh, on religion and development, entitled Development, Civil Society and Faith-Based Organizations, Bridging the Sec Sacred and the Secular. And finally, there's a third strand of Mike's profile, which is his work on global health and development. Throughout his research, Mike's attention to evidence is at the basis of his critical approach. He unpicks the assumptions that are embedded in institutions. In researching child sponsorship, faith-based medical professionals, or faith-based organizations and their relationship with government, Mike's attention to evidence is clear both in his problematization and in his conclusions. He is the voice of curiosity and reason, teasing out the gaps and contra contradictions that exist in institutional narratives and practices. In his work on NGOs, too, he tickles out how they were beguiled by their own interpretation of what was taking place in resettlement processes in Tanzania in the 60s and 70s, and how this led to them uncritically carrying out the work of an overbearing state. In his conclusions, Mike is nuanced and careful. His is not a political project beyond the politics of identifying gaps and inconsist inconsistencies in the evidence and asking what purpose they serve and what outcomes they deliver, and, as a curative, how they can be filled. Mike is adaptable. We cannot celebrate Mike as a professor without also recognizing his tremendous service to the university. In addition to his impressive research career, Mike has been head of department and has served on executive board, academic board, the board of trustees. He was the chair of the Center for African Studies and sat on the management committee of the Mo Ibrahim Foundation and SOAS Governance for Development in Africa Initiative. These are roles that he's filled with immense professionalism and practicality and also incredible sensitivity and generosity. Mike supports people. Colleagues rely on Mike for his judgment and his strength, and he has led the department through a time of extreme uncertainty at school level. Students pick up on his qualities too. Mike's attentiveness to institutional narratives and practices enables him to promote equal success and widen participation at SOAS by gui guiding students to pick through the obstacles that they face. Mike is a scholar for our times. He's relevant, clear, insightful, and personable. Mike understands that the academy, for all the struggles it faces, is what we make it. And it's all the better for his contributions. Mike, thanks for being a wonderful colleague and a leader in your research. Now, I can't say it was easy to source an accordion for tonight. <laughs> so instead, I would like to invite Mike to give his inaugural lecture, Professor Michael Jennings. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Zoe. If Zoe's appreciation of my musical ability uh, is completely deluded, and a lot of what she said would, you know, about my research expertise would sound hollow if you actually heard me play. There's a reason it's now in the back of the attic. <laughs> we begin uh, with the customary thanks. So thanks very much to Dan and Nick and the whole events team uh, for setting up uh, this evening. It takes an awful lot of effort, and I really appreciate everything you've done. Of course, huge thanks to, to Laura and Zoe, not just for their kind words, which are very gratifying for the ego, for my family's sake. I suspect it would be better if we went for the Roman triumph tradition with Zoe standing behind me as I speak tonight saying, you two are mortal. <laughs> um, but I appreciate it. I don't, I'm not sure I entirely believe it, but I do appreciate it. And, but we have been colleagues pretty much, well, since I've been here. And uh, thank you both for your support. Um, I have some family here uh, this evening, uh, so thanks very much uh, for coming, uh, albeit perhaps uh, at the very last minute. Uh, the promise was mostly built that they'd get to see me process in, wear a silly robe and an even sillier hat, uh, a reception afterwards, but um, they do have to listen to me speak for 30 minutes, although I'm pretty sure I actually said 20 minutes, so I've uh, tricked them in that extent, and I'm also now going to take off my hat. That duty is done. A particular thanks to my mum, uh, who, uh, particularly for her support during my master's uh, and my PhD, and obviously has been there throughout the whole journey, but also uh, my other family who are here tonight. It means a lot. Uh, and I've also got my wife, Vicky, and my kids with me as well, and it's great uh, for them to be able to see me in my well, natural environment, I'm not sure, but at least in, in this environment where I spend so much time. Um, this is actually the 30th anniversary of me coming to SOAS back in 1994. I turned up bright-eyed uh, to begin my Master's in African Studies. Uh, and then I went on to do a PhD in the History Department uh, with Dave Anson. Many of you here will know Dave Anson. Yeah, he can't be here this evening, sadly, but I owe him a, an immense debt uh, for all of his support and pushing me in this direction. Of course, it's a tradition when anyone from SOAS speaks about our institution, we have to include the line, SOAS can be a very frustrating place to work. <laughs> yeah, it's true, but actually in thinking about this and thinking about the 30 years, I remember just being amazed when I came to SOAS about how dynamic it was, how interesting it was, how strange it was that you could have an institution that just focuses on Africa, Asia and the Middle East. And I think sometimes when you've been here a long time, when you're kind of immersed in the day-to-day, -day, you forget just how peculiar but how necessary that is, given the depth or the lack of depth and the quality of international discourses around other societies, culture, politics, uh, and so on. Um, so I really did, and I came back after my PhD, I came back in 2007 to SOAS and to my new department, the Department of Development Studies, and I've got many colleagues here dotted around the room, often at the back, uh, even though I know we all tell our students when the room's empty, come to the front, come to the front. So for our students here, just notice where they're sitting and ignore them. Um, uh, you know, so I also owe them uh, both past and present colleagues, but also uh, students of whom I can see some of our brilliant PhD students showing us here. There may be others I've missed, but thanks to you uh, as well. Because, you know, I'll come back to this at the end, but research is actually a collective endeavour. And we owe thanks to the people that surround us, the people that we talk to, that we listen to, and that help build us up uh, as researchers. So... I think in preparing for inaugural and thinking about what I wanted to say, these are really moments for not just reflecting on where we are, but reflecting on how we got here. Thinking about those various strands, those separate strands of research that we undertook just because perhaps we were interested in something. And then looking back and thinking about what unites them, what brings them all together. So, as Zoe said, I began my uh, research journey as a historian looking at the role of NGOs non-state actors in Tanzania in the 60s and 70s. And then when I moved to Oxford for my postdoc, I went further back in time looking at the role of medical missionaries in um, health service provision. So that kind of built up my strand on non-state actors in development and began uh, also some of the work on religion that I would later build on. In 2002, I shifted not only institution but also discipline when I went to Swansea's Centre for Development Studies. Now starting to immerse myself and move away from kind of the historical literature, now into the literature on development studies. Suddenly seeing all the gaps and the mistakes that I've made in my PhD and my other research that I could have really benefited from a greater immersion in this. 
Uh, you can't read everything, but it, it was a real benefit um, to the research that I was doing, the historical research that I was doing, as well as the more contemporary focus. And it was there that I built up the third strand on religion and development. So when I returned to SOAS in 2007, uh, it was, uh, I started to build on those three strands, and they started to come together and form a much more coherent whole in terms of the research. But still, even when I was taking more contemporary focus, using that historical lens to explore and to question some of the assumptions. There isn't time to go into this. I could have written a whole lecture on how angry it makes me every time I see the statement that global modern development began in 1945 and 1946 with the creation of the Bretton Woods institutions and the Marshall Plan Aid. Um, as all historians uh, of aid and development know, you need to go back much further to look for those origins. And I think these are actually really important. It's not just kind of historical pedantry. It does change the way that you understand and think about it when you adapt that historical lens, or you adopt that historical lens. But over the past 12 months or so, this academic year, I've gone back, I've started going back to those NGO archives and those other archives in the 60s and 70s where I began. And I think it's a particularly interesting time. It's a time when academics, activists, politicians, and others were thinking about what literal decolonization looks like and should be in sub-Saharan Africa what development as an idea and as an outcome and as a process should be, about popular participation, issues around equality and power, and how those could be better reflected in the work of development that was being done. Last week I was reading uh, something by Fred Cooper. Uh, we wrote it in the mid-1990s. And he was discussing the way that academic historians writing in the 1960s, many of whom, of course, were based at SOAS, or certainly passed through SOAS, in that moment of decolonization, changed the way they thought they should understand and write and think about African history to try and capture those moments. But this wasn't just something that happened in history. This was also something that happened in other disciplines, in other areas, including global development. So global development in the 1960s, I think, wasn't interesting just because it was about the kind of formal expansion of global north institutions into that realm, picking up and taking on new responsibilities. But it's because at the same time, if you look closely, if you look in the right places, you can see new voices. You can see the emergence of radical alternatives being proposed. Um, now, Cooper also shows that by the end of that decade, that moment of optimism had passed. The kind of hoped-for liberation didn't occur, and people started to look more towards the structures and institutions, particularly the global structures and institutions and policies that constrained, that limited, that made the search for alternatives much harder. But albeit perhaps for a brief period, I think we can see a moment of possibilities uh, and perhaps one with echoes today. And I thought that this return to my research is past, but the research that I'm doing looking forward would be a really good subject for the inaugural today, sort of going back to my origins, but in the new research that I'm doing. And I've long been interested in volunteerism and development. When I did my PhD, I lived in a compound of concrete huts in Dar es Salaam, where the VSO would send their new volunteers and bring their existing volunteers for inductions and meetings and so on. And I got to know them passing through. We'd talk about their experiences, their motivations, the things that drove them compared to me and my uh, friend, colleague, Andrew Burton, who was also doing research at the same time, kind of making our way around the local bars and having our conversations there. And more recently, as I started work on this project, I was talking to a colleague just by chance uh, from Kenya who lives in Sierra Leone and had first gone to Sierra Leone as a volunteer. Uh, and we were chatting about how his experiences differed from his colleagues from the global north, from Europe, from North America, how expectations were different, how narratives about what volunteerism was, what it might be, its implications, looks slightly different when you stop thinking about them as a, perhaps someone who's just left university and someone who's coming from within the global south. And what does this mean about the way we think 
about the volunteer or our image of the volunteer. At the turn of the century, uh, Helmut Anheyer and Lester Salomon suggested that development volunteering at the dawn of the 21st century was something new. It was transformative. We were seeing uh, an international phenomenon. It just wasn't the case at all. And in fact, everyone who works in SOAS, because of our particular focus, will know that this wasn't the case. Volunteering of this type had been going on throughout the 20th century and before in sub-Saharan Africa and, of course, elsewhere. But it was a moment when academic interest started to emerge in volunteering. So it was recognised rather than suddenly appearing newly. And I think that that research was influenced by a number of things, including the fact that during the 1990s, rhetoric and policy around volunteerism, volunteering and voluntary institutions was adopted by governments of both the right and the left across Europe and North America. And it was also a reflection of a steep rise at the time in what has been called often disparagingly, um, gap year tourism or volunteerism. And I think there are four key elements to a lot of this work on volunteering that are interesting to me for the kind of things that they suggest about what it is and what it should be and the impact it has. Firstly, a development, uh, sorry, a definition of development volunteerism, which privileges international volunteering. So a form of migration from the global north to the Global South. Secondly, and linked to this, a discourse around volunteerism as an expression of saviourism, and in particular a form of white saviourism that forms a key part of decolonisation of development critiques. Thirdly, volunteerism is seen very much from an individual perspective. It's a pro-social form of altruistic civic engagement. The volunteer gives up their time gives up their comfort to go and work in a poor country and help other people who are less fortunate. And finally, where approaches to volunteering take a more structural view, they tend to see it as a form of gap-filling. So taking up the uh, responsibilities of states where, kind of as part of, kind of neoliberal policies, the state has retreated and relied increasingly on private actors. Now, I'm not saying that those are necessarily wrong or uh, that they don't actually make sense. What I'm saying is that they only tell a partial story. And the reason they only tell a partial story is because they leave out something immense. They leave out the biggest part of volunteering, which is the role played by Global South volunteers. And what happens when we look at those stories, both the histories and the modern, and the, modern you know, the contemporary um, impact of Global South volunteering. How does that challenge and change the way that the volunteer and volunteering as a whole concept is understood and presented? So if I asked you for a portrait or to picture in your mind the volunteer, most of you will probably think, or most of us, will probably think of the time-worn trope of someone young, pre or perhaps immediately post-university, earnest, committed to saving the world, uh, making a difference and wearing a T-shirt that proves it, um, probably from a comfortable middle-class background, engaged in activities that almost certainly involve children and young people in a foreign country. Um, of course, this has its basis in reality. But even if we're just thinking about Global North volunteers... Um, the caricature masks a huge variety of different types, different levels, different ways of engaging. So, of course, yes, there are the young, unskilled, probably out for a sense of adventure as much as trying to make a difference over a short-term uh, placement of maybe weeks, perhaps a little bit longer. But there are also highly skilled professionals who are going out as a form of technical assistance, paid for, supported by official aid, um, but even this more nuanced picture of the volunteer, it remains one of the Global North volunteer. And if you read the literature, there is sometimes a sense that there is a difference between the development volunteering, which is always someone from the Global North travelling to a different country, and one gets labelled rather derogatively as, as domestic volunteering, 
where someone is kind of taking up small tasks, not necessarily making a difference, but doing good in their own small community. It's a very patronising way of understanding it. Um, and I think there's perhaps an echo here of Terence Ranger's uh, reflections and observations about missions in sub-Saharan Africa. So missions often thought of as, of course, being very white, very European institutions. But Terry argued that by the 1930s, in most or in many countries in sub-Saharan Africa at least, the African experience of mission was actually an African experience, not a European one. It was Africans who made up the vast majority of mission staff, whether as lay workers, pastors, clerics in training, uh, working in dispensaries or as teachers. And I think we can see that in volunteering as well. The vast number, the vast overwhelming majority of volunteers, whether we're talking about the colonial period in the 1960s or today, are not those from overseas. Uh, the volunteer is far, far more likely to be a Tanzanian, a Kenyan, a South African, than they are uh, an American, a Brit, or someone from Germany. Now, traditional Global North volunteerism was present in Tanzania in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, Nyerere's philosophy of Ujimaa, which is often translated as African socialism, attracted huge numbers of kind of fellow um, ideological travellers who wanted to be part of this new radical experiment in living and being. And of course there were those who fitted the white saviour narrative. Voluntourism was a thing perhaps even then. In 1962, the government received a letter from an American organisation who sent students there during their holidays to do good works to help people in poor countries. And it asked if the government would be prepared to host such a group in Dar es Salaam to help build a new school. All they asked for in return was food and lodgings and a driver and a lorry and skilled builders and building materials. A civil servant scrawling on the note to be sent up to his superior dryly noted that these volunteers would likely be more of a nuisance than they were worth. But many other volunteers came and engaged in a deeply political engagement, saw this as their opportunity to express a kind of global citizenship based around this new idea of Ujamaa. Many engaged in global development in this era of decolonisation had been brought there precisely because of those movements. Uh, you know, they were influenced and shaped by them. They wanted to engage in ways that they saw as offering a difference, an alternative to Western orthodox narratives, to try something different, to try something new. Um, now, of course... That isn't to say that it was unproblematic. That isn't to say that power differentials were flattened, that there weren't all kinds of problems that we can see. But I think it's a very different form for many of these volunteers than the kind of saviorism narratives that often get at um, attached to the concept of the volunteer. I think there genuinely was a, sen a new sense of citizenship beyond the state, global citizenship, based on a notion of duty and obligation to others around the world, no matter where they might be, not imposing Western values necessarily and working with and for communities. And we can certainly see many examples of individuals who lived up to those quite worthy and lofty aspirations. Of course, Tanzania may well have been something unique. I think Tanzania had the third highest number of volunteers, uh, formal volunteers, from the Global North uh, in the mid-1960s. And partly that was a reflection, perhaps, of poverty, but it was also a reflection of the people who wanted to go there. Tanzania attracted people who wanted to participate, who liked what Nyerere was saying and saw it as important to be involved. To be a volunteer in Tanzania at this time was to not just be a volunteer for small-scale projects or training, but to volunteer in support of an idea, a new form of politics. One of my favourite interviews whilst doing my PhD, and I didn't do many interviews, I'm always much more comfortable in an archive, but one of my favourite interviews was with a former missionary who was living in the White Father's retirement home uh, nearby the cathedral in Dar es Salaam. Uh, and he had chosen to come to Tanzania partly because of his faith, but more because of Ujamaa. This was someone whose faith was 
Ujamaa. And the, this retirement home was full of former missionaries for whom liberation theology was probably a little bit centrist. Uh, people who had come, and you could still see the fire of Ujamaa burning in their eyes some two decades uh, later. And they would tell with glee over dinner stories of fellow missionaries who had been thrown out of the country for being slightly too Marxist as the state became a bit more authoritarian. Um, so in the early 1960s and the 1970s, if you were interested in challenging Western development orthodoxies and thinking about what meaningful decolonization should look like and be, if you were interested in ideas about community engagement, <coughs> excuse me, empowerment and conscientization, then if you weren't in Latin America, you almost certainly passed through Tanzania at some point. This was something of a problem while I was doing my PhD because every time I did a seminar and I would give my interpretation from the archives of what happened, one member, usually of the history faculty, would have spent their time in the University of Dar es Salaam in the 60s and 70s, kind of the epicentre of kind of radical African history, and would tell me in no uncertain terms how I was wrong. But whilst Global North volunteers were important and significant particularly in their local areas and their local politics, and they were important as international allies for Nyerere's ideas. They were a very small part of volunteerism and the history of volunteerism in the countries, by far outnumbered by Tanzanian volunteers. And volunteerism in Tanzania took many forms. The, what I'm going to be focusing on today is the formal volunteerism that took place embedded within the state, known as self-help or nation-building volunteerism. And this wasn't just a core part of Tanzanian development policy in the 60s, but it was seen as a fundamental aspect of building a new nation, of doing something different and doing it from a community, people-led perspective. It wasn't just about extracting cheap or unpaid labour. It wasn't about substituting for a state that didn't have sufficient resources to be able to run projects in every village, in every district, in every region. It was about, it was consciously and explicitly about collaborating, harnessing the energies of people across the country in a collaboration with the state and decolonizing, developing and building anew. So self-help was a critical, integral part of Nureri's project, built into the structures of the state development planning system itself. So villagers would come up with their own ideas about the kinds of things that they wanted to see in, in their communities. These would be built into village development plans, which would then be passed up and incorporated in district, and then regional, and then ultimately passed on to the national level, where they would then be written formally into the three- and five-year development plans. So this was part, a core part of the state. This wasn't volunteerism as something extra, something additional. It wasn't filling a gap. This was part and parcel of how the state saw its development and nation-building project being achieved. And it wasn't just a paper exercise. These things don't, didn't just exist in the form of these village, district, regional and national plans. Across Tanzania in the 1960s, the scale of activity was immense. Officials noted high turnouts across the country and across the decade. Uh, just as one example, in Mbeya region, in one year, in 1963, communities built 88 schools, 57 communi uh, community centres, 26 clinics and dispensaries. Uh, they also built more than 2,000 miles of road and 231 new bridges, amongst other schemes. And this is on top of, in addition to participation in communal agricultural projects, and in the extensive adult education and literacy programmes that were also going on at the same time. And you can see reports on similar levels of activity going on across the whole country and across the decade. Indeed, I think one of the things that shows how significant the activity was and how important to communities rather than the state was the level of concern the government expressed in the 1960s, not over the lack of engagement, but that too much was being done and too much outside of government control. There are endless reports in the archives from district development officials, from political officers and even from the vice president warning that the number of spontaneous and off-plan development projects was far too significant. 
was far too much for the state to be able to cope. Across the country, communities would begin working on schools, on clinics, on irrigation channels and so on, without waiting for any kind of formal approval and without waiting for any kind of resources to be made available. And importantly, this wasn't seen as gap-filling. The state was very clear that this was not just a response to limited and a lack of resources. Those shortages were real, of course they were, but still self-help voluntary labour was given an importance in its own right. It was both a means and an end in itself. It was an expression of a particular type of virtuous citizenship. Um, and this was central to Nureri's philosophy. A form of citizenship that didn't rely so much on Western notions of citizenship that emphasised individual rights, but rather one that focused on duties and obligations uh, and collective action. Uh, in, the late, in the late 1960s, one particular development officer was growing increasingly concerned over the progress of a particular building project. Not only was it going slowly, but the quality wasn't so good. So he sent in a request to, um, uh, to ask for permission to formally hire some skilled workers to complete the work. And he was told, no, absolutely not. The rules forbade it. The value of the work was as much in the manner of construction, i.e. through voluntary labour, as actually what ended up being constructed itself. So nation building, this voluntary self-help labour, was as much um, a construction of the idea of citizenship as it was about physical infrastructure. Participation was a demonstration of commitment and loyalty to the new nation as much as it was, if not more, than a source of cheap labour. One result was that during the 1960s, the state was remarkably, given what happened in the next decade, unwilling to sanction the use of overt force and compulsion, despite growing calls from local governments and local development officials who felt completely overwhelmed by both the scale of activity, off-plan activity, but also concerns of what would happen if people weren't participating. Because if participation wasn't willing, if it wasn't voluntary, then how could it be an expression of the virtuous citizenship? Now, this isn't to say, of course, that coercion and compulsion didn't happen, but rather that overt use of force was relatively limited. But by linking that linkage of voluntary self-help labour to this notion of citizenship, to this notion of the good Tanzanian, and it's very explicit, not just in the way that it's talked about, not just in Nureri's speeches, but the way people understood it as well, strong moral pressure could be exerted. And it's clear that many people, or it seems clear that many people were participating because of that moral pressure, because of the expectation. And of course this raises questions about just how voluntary, voluntary labour is. So to go back to some of the more contemporary focused literature on voluntarism, active agency is central to most definitions. To be volunteering, to be volunteerism, it must be an individual altruistic act. But the example of Tanzania and a wider emerging literature on African volunteerism suggests this is far too simple. Badadine's work, for example, on Kenyan women volunteers for Al-Shabaab points to a huge continuity between coercion and individual agency, often within the same individual over a period of time. And research on volunteerism as labour rather than altruism also emphasises this. So Cathy Dobworth and Makungu's research on voluntary health labour in Kenya, for example, again highlights or, or questions this notion that volunteerism must be defined by altruism. And we can see this elsewhere. In North America, there's some uh, research looking at social workers um, who are expected or feel they are expected to undertake extra unwaged voluntary labour uh, as part of their duties and that if they don't, they'll be overlooked uh, for promotions and that their careers will suffer. In the state of Maryland, I think this is still in existence. In order to graduate from high school, you need to complete a set number of hours of voluntary service. So again, how voluntary is voluntary if you need it to graduate? So I think this focus on altruism, as well, input, as, well as putting the attention to individual rather than allowing for more structural systemic thinking about the way volunteerism fits in societies, also I think misses the point 
that it is possible to have that continuity, that, that, diff that some people motivated more by individual agency, some people motivated perhaps more by feeling that it's something they ought to, and perhaps some people would be motivated by something more akin to force. And it still fits within that volunteerism space. And when you start looking at that, I think it allows us to see volunteering and volunteerism uh, in a much wider set of contexts and in a much more nuanced way. So why was there such a high level of participation in Tanzania in the 1960s? If forced coercion can't in itself explain it, and I'm just going to focus very quickly on two drivers that I think are important. Firstly, volunteerism within a politics of scarcity. And secondly, volunteerism as an expression of the virtuous citizen. Explaining why so many Tanzanian communities seem to be starting their own off-plan self-help projects, an official in Takuyu district suggested it was a conscious effort, a strategy to try and gain access to resources before other communities could lay their own claims to them. In Mara region, another official noted something similar. Villages competing with neighbouring villages to secure access to funds and resources. And of course, Tanzania, like so many sub-Saharan African countries in this period, was operating in the politics of scarcity. Demand for more resources than were available. And that meant that self-help became a space where local communities, local uh, elites, and a new kind of political entrepreneur cadre could gain the system to secure access to those resources that those communities needed, not least by getting a head start on work and then presenting the government with a fait accompli. You know, here's our school building, now give us teachers, now give us books. But more than that, it was an opportunity where communities could affect their own priorities, their own vision of what development should be and look like, and contest and subvert official visions of the future that they saw for the country. In his inaugural address in 1962, President Ureri said, I look to every citizen of our country to join in the fight against poverty, ignorance and disease. And anyone who interferes in our war effort, I for my part shall look upon as a traitor and an enemy of our country. So self-help voluntary labour wasn't just a form of work, it wasn't just about building an infrastructure, uh, it wasn't just a literal construction of a physical new nation, but it was a moral force. It was an idea of what it meant to be a good Tanzanian, a good Tanzanian, a loyal Tanzanian, someone who was not an enemy of the state, was by definition someone who volunteered their labour, volunteered their time, volunteered their resources in the creation of this new nation. So it became a space around which discussions of what citizenship meant and should mean, um, about what it meant to be modern, what it meant to be developed, took place. And this strong emphasis on obligation, the strong emphasis on the way that communities gain their citizenship, not through being given rights, not even through working as individuals, but through working together as a collectivity, was essential, was a key part of that. And of course that created pressure on people to conform. Uh, people may have felt external pressure, but they also felt an internal pressure. They wanted to be, and more importantly perhaps, to be seen to be a good Tanzanian, worthy of not being cast out as an enemy of the state. And we can see some of the ways these issues played in reflection of particular groups. So, for example, Asian Tanzanians, who were subject to questions and challenges to their citizenship in many public discourses throughout the 1960s and 70s. Um, being perceived to reject or to resist self-help labour became a site whereby their Tanzanianness Tanzanian could be challenged and questioned. Uh, there were reports throughout the decade of Tana Youth League um, members, so uh, kind of youth members of the ruling party, who would force, literally force some Asian Tanzanians to undertake uh, labour or subject others who continued to resist to abuse. And most political leaders kind of continued the official line that coercion was not acceptable. They ascribed such violence in the way that all officials always do to kind of inexperience and overenthusiasm. But they also reinforced the idea that such incidents uh, took place and the conditions in which they took place by noting that 
this label was for the benefit of all communities, and it's only right that all members of the community should participate in carrying them out. And of course, the Asian Tanzanian experience was shaped by an already equivocal place in the new nation. But I think it shows some of the ways that volunteerism and self-help labour as citizenship more widely became entwined, became discussed and debated in this period. Um, it shows the way that it became about much more than an expression of individual altruism, but about that performance of and claim to being a good Tanzanian, being a virtuous citizen. And without that performance, without being seen to take part, that could be questioned, it could be challenged and perhaps even taken away. By the end of the 1960s, uh, this state's vision, the state's vision of utopia had become uh, a coercive one. In the 1970s, as most people here uh, will undoubtedly know, millions of people would be forced to move into new villages in one of the world's largest resettlement campaigns. The scope for independent rival futures was limited and the states was the one that became the dominant driving narrative. There were to be no rivals to their utopian vision. And we see this too in volunteerism. It was sharply limited. In 1969, the government exerted or changed the way that development would be undertaken. No longer would plans emanate upwards from the communities themselves. From now on, it was to be a top-down process. The central government would say what was needed, what was necessary, what would be done, where and when. New laws were enacted to compel uh, voluntary self-help labour through threats of imprisonment, threats of fines and other punishments. So it's not necessarily the death of voluntary labour itself, but perhaps the death of its imagining as a powerful, transformational, people-centred effort. And look, there are huge gaps in this narrative, of course. You know, who are the ones who didn't participate and why? How was it gendered? How did it relate to generation and age? How does it reflect power inequalities and marginalisations within communities? And so on. But still, I think that we can see that looking at the history of volunteerism in Tanzania forces us to ask questions about the notion of volunteerism and the volunteer itself, as well as, of course, asking questions about the construction of the new nation of Tanzania in this period. So it, it highlights the importance of not excluding, of engaging with Global South volunteering and thinking about expanding it more widely, both geographically and temporally. And I think it's also to think about that time of the 1960s, something that is a bit neglected, perhaps seen as being kind of idealistic and over-optimistic. Um, and I can kind of see that, but I also, and perhaps this is just immersion, I've kind of lived in the world of kind of 1960s development workers for so long now that you know, perhaps it's a bit of uh, Stockholm Syndrome. But I think there is something there about a new way of thinking. As, as that decolonisation moment happened in sub-Saharan Africa, a whole range of people, not everyone, of course, not in every institution, but a, an important part of development sector started thinking in new ways, not just about how development should be done, but how, as global citizens, we could come together in new radical collectivities and radical solidarities. It was a relatively brief moment, perhaps, when that kind of flame of optimism flickered before the 1970s, but I still think it was an important one, and I think there are ripples that echo down to current debates today. So I'm going to end with the words of another academic, someone whose career first emerged or who was forged in those kind of 1960s hothouse of hope and imperfect, problematic, but still important ideas of radical global solidarity. And to thank someone that I didn't mention at the start of the lecture. Our students tell us, and I'm sure this is the experience of, of most people here, that sometimes our teaching can create a sense of paralysis, a sense that what can we actually do against kind of the implacable immenseness and power of institutions, of global policies and systems and structures? So my dad was a development economist. Um, he died before kind of decided to do my master's. So we never had those conversations as adults uh, as to this shared world that we have both inhabited. But there's no doubt about his influence in shaping not just where I am today, but also my thinking and my approach. And he wrote this with Tom Weiss. A reminder, I think, that we're not powerless, that there are reasons for hope. 
An inaugural is intended as a celebration of the individual's research. So, uh, you know, very kind words from Zoe, but all focused on me. But all of our research, my research, is a collective endeavour. It reflects the partners and communities we work with, the colleagues that we share and discuss our ideas with and learn from, the past research that helps shape helps shape our thoughts and the way we approach things. Listening to the experiences and chatting with our amazing students is a real learning um, environment for us as much as we hope it is for them. And the discussions we have with friends and family when we try and explain what it is that we're doing and realise that perhaps it doesn't make sense and try and think about new ways of engaging with it. Um, so I think that this should really be a celebration of our collective endeavours. In this case, the, the research of the Department of Development Studies, which, as Laura said, is kind of one of the best departments in the world, doing absolutely amazing research, but also SOAS more widely. One of the things I loved when I came here, and I've still loved after all these years, is just that breadth and depth of research that gets done within SOAS as an institution that I think we should all be collectively incredibly proud of and hopefully influences and inspires us all in our own work. Because I think that our research, the work that we do in this department and SOAS as a whole, is playing a vital role, not as saviour, but as one partner in a broader collective effort in developing and thinking about and showing knowledge and thinking that can help challenge that inertia, challenge those seemingly all-powerful institutions and help us understand the power that we can collectively mobilise and give us all real reasons for hope. Thank you very much for coming and for listening.